spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Chaminade University. Aloha, good morning. Thank you so much for being here on Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji. Ryan, we saw another high number of case counts today, over 600 new coronavirus infections reported in the state of Hawaii. Uh, where are we going with all of this? We've, we're going straight to the source now, directly to a very important guest this morning. That's right. We're going to be talking with the Department of Health Director, Dr. Libby Char, joining us this morning to talk more about those cases. Good morning, Dr. Char. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, let's start off right at the top there. As Yanji said, 625 cases reported today, but uh, another alarming number in that is eight, eight new deaths related to COVID-19. Uh, what can you tell us about the numbers that we're seeing here today? Yeah, so we're still on a on an upward trend in terms of our case counts. Um, we haven't seen a plateau and we certainly haven't seen it going down yet. Um, I think what's concerning is that we still have almost 40% of our population that's not fully vaccinated. Uh, fully vaccinated, we're at 62.3% and we have 70% of our population that's at least initiated vaccine. So very happy that those numbers are going up. Um, but that still leaves a whole lot of people that are not vaccinated and that's where we're seeing COVID. And unfortunately, those who are unvaccinated can get COVID and that can affect the rest of us who are fully vaccinated. Well, let's talk about that ICU capacity because we know that those who are unvaccinated tend to be the ones who do end up in the hospitals. How are our hospitals doing across the state right now? Uh, the hospitals are really struggling. I mean, they are working as hard as they can. Um, you know, I really feel for my, my healthcare colleagues because they're, they're working long hours they're working under difficult situations and by and large the people who are in the hospital are unvaccinated uh, people getting covid um, if you are fully vaccinated there's a possibility that you get sick um, and, and we know that there have been some breakthrough cases but by and large it is unvaccinated people in the hospital and i think what's really concerning is that we're seeing younger and younger people in the hospital um, you know, I'm hearing of children that are getting COVID from their parents who are unvaccinated. We're seeing people in their 30s and 40s in the hospital, um, and we didn't see that a year ago. If we can say a little more on the hospitalizations and what we're seeing, uh, you mentioned we're seeing younger um, patients that have contracted COVID-19, uh, but is there anything else that you are learning about the people that are being admitted to the hospitals besides uh, vaccinated, unvaccinated, anything else that's being learned through this process. And uh, on average, how long uh, are these individuals staying in the hospital and taking up these critical ICU beds? So it, it really varies. Um, but we know that if you're vaccinated, you don't get as sick. Usually you don't usually end, end, end up in the hospital. Um, and it's, it's rare to see anybody have an unfortunate death related to COVID if you're fully vaccinated. Um, and what we're seeing now is that if you are fully vaccinated, if you have a breakthrough case, maybe you end up in the hospital for a few days or so. Um, those who are not vaccinated who end up in the hospital are, have much more severe illness and much, much longer hospital stays. Um, and so it, it really is all about getting vaccinated. It's, it's very protective. You know, the governor, when he was on with us on Monday, said that shutting down the state, doing a full lockdown was a last resort for him. And his sort of litmus for this is really the ICU capacity. And he said that if he gets word from the, you know, healthcare providers that they simply cannot take any more, that he would look at a full shutdown. How far are we away from that? In other words, how much time or caseload or wiggle room really do we have before we get to that absolute point? Um, it's such a fluid situation that it makes it really hard to to quantify or to qualify in, in terms of a, a day or a week or a month. Um, certainly, we are discussing it. it. It's on the table. Everything's on the table, um, and and it's 
it's something that we're we're discussing regularly you know it should be a last resort it is a last resort but it's definitely on the table you know healthcare is a critical infrastructure and so i think the other thing that we oftentimes fail to remember is that the hospitals are really full and it's not just covid covid is additive and covid is that additional stress but the hospitals are already full with you know regular patients with trauma patients people are out and about where we see traumas nationwide are, are much much higher um and so that's already keeping the healthcare system busy and then when you add in covid and you add in icu stays related to covid and the, just the crush of the number of covid patients um that's just an added stress on an already busy healthcare system and so i think that's that's really what it is it's not that, that the absolute number of COVID patients is, you know, is tipping hospitals or it's that in addition to all the regular hospital patients. You know, for a long time, we've been marching towards that 70% vaccination rate, which was a benchmark that the governor initially set before we've gotten caught up in this Delta variant wave, if you will. Uh, what do you think that new benchmark for the vaccination rate should be now, given where we're at and recognizing that uh, uh, is 70% enough? Yeah, so when, when we came up with the 70% initially, that was the number that we thought um, that would provide good protection for our community. Um, I think it was a very reasonable number based on what we were seeing at the time and, and the, you know, the epidemiology of it. Um, right now, a lot of that, that number, that protective number we talk about herd immunity has to do with um, the transmissibility of, of a virus or, or of a, you know, whatever the germs are. And so, to know that this Delta variant is so much more transmissible. And instead of me having COVID and infecting a couple of other people, you know, now it means me having COVID infecting seven or eight other people. And so that number, absolutely 70% is not going to be uh, the same number that it was a year ago. Um, I've heard some people talking about, um, you know, something as high as 87 or 90%. Um, I think this is such a fluid situation that we, it, it's, it's a hard call right now, but certainly it's higher than 70%. I wanna bring in some of the audience question. Marie has a question here. She says, if they are worried about children getting the virus, why are schools open? Do you think that schools are still safe? That's, that's a really good question. And, and we're hearing that a lot. Um, the schools actually are doing a fantastic job. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of misunderstanding about it because you see numbers that are posted related to schools but those big numbers aren't necessarily the numbers of people that were on campus or even you know putting anybody at risk it's because you know if you're if you're a teacher you get reported as tied to the schools um and when you actually look at the number of students that were on campus or that that were in contact with others it's a much much smaller number that being said of course there's a risk you know and, and I think what we need to remember is that schools are a reflection of our community. So if we have raging COVID in our community, it's going to put the schools at that much more risk. That being said, again, the schools have done a wonderful job of just layer upon layer of mitigation factors and knock on wood, but thus far we have had um, no large clusters within the schools. It's typically kids getting infected at home or outside and then showing up at school sick and the schools have been able to identify those students and, and you know, try and separate and do the contact tracing and, and pull anybody who may have been a contact out so that they're not spreading anything to anybody else. Um, and when you look at, I think it's like 140,000 students in DOE, um, I think they've done a remarkably good job and, you know, kudos to the superintendent Hayashi and his team, um, the administrators, the teachers, they have all been really, really hands-on working on this. We have another question here. It's pretty lengthy, so I'll summarize it. Uh, it's basically the last part. Are we seeing effectiveness of vaccines wearing down as the months go on? This is a question from Jody uh, asking. You know, there's a lot of talk about booster shots and, and things of uh, this caliber and, and what is needed right now for those who have gone a few months since getting the vaccine. Uh, what can you say uh, to answer this question about the effectiveness of vaccines wearing down over time? So what we do know is that vaccines continue to be safe and they continue to do exactly what they were designed to do, which is to minimize severe illness and hospitalization and death. And that has played out time and again. And if you look at who's in the hospital right now, um, it's people who are unvaccinated by and large. So we know that hospital um, that vaccines are doing what they're supposed to do. 
Um, what we heard was um, about third doses and about booster shots. The third dose has been approved for those who have significant um, immune compromise. So people who have had organ transplants and people who may have active, you know, HIV infection or who are on chemotherapy or whatever. The reason for that is that their immune system is such that them receiving two shots likely did not result in them developing enough antibodies to protect themselves. And that's why that third shot is, is being recommended. Um, it has been discussed by the FDA. It received emergency use authorization, and it was then discussed by um, ASIP, and it went to the CDC. And so that's where we are, that that's, that's a good thing to do. If you're immune compromised, go get a third shot. As far as everybody else, what we're seeing is just looking at um, immunity and measuring you know, antibodies and whatnot. We know that the vaccine is still safe. It's still effective in what it was designed to do. But we know that now, you know, if you've been fully vaccinated, it's still possible that you can become infected, which is drastically different than saying, you know, you're going to become severely ill or you're going to die from it. But we're concerned because if you get infected, we don't want you passing it on to others. And so that's the, the talk right now about the the booster shots is to try and boost the immunity that people have developed against the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. There are a lot of questions in the in the comments this morning about tourists and travelers. We know that they account for a small number of the cases, but do you think that it would be wise to add the pre-travel testing back, not only because that would catch uh, the travelers coming in, but also co returning Kama'aina. We know that a lot of returning residents uh, tend to bring back the virus. So if we had that pre-travel testing, perhaps some of those folks would be uh, caught in those numbers as well. What are your thoughts on bringing back pre-travel testing? So with anything, there are pros and cons. Um, it, I think pre-travel testing, if, if we had more people testing before they came, that would be a good way to, to try and pick up on some infections that people might not even be aware that they had. Um, but we have to, I think for what people think it's going to do, it may not do exactly that. Because if I travel to the mainland right now, um, I can come home and just say, I'm not going to get tested. I'm just going to go into quarantine. And we're seeing a lot of uh, locals who just opt to just say, I'm just going to go into quarantine and not take that test. And so even though you say, I, I need to, you know, you're going to mandate it for all the travelers, I still have that option of just saying, no, I'm not going to take it. I'm just going to go into quarantine. And so that's not going to change for that population. And that's probably the population that's not vaccinated, um, that's at higher risk. We still, it's still not going to catch that population. So while it may, you know, encourage visitors to do it um, for the largest section, which is the returning residents, that's where our biggest risk comes from. It, it still wouldn't necessarily make them go and get a test before traveling home. Another question we have here from Stephanie asking, what happens uh, if staff levels at hospitals can't be sustained? There are only so many travel providers who can come in and provide respite, especially considering the need for assistance everywhere as opposed to one or two hotspots. We spoke to the governor about this and he also mentioned that this is not something that is confined to Hawaii. This surge is uh, being seen throughout the country with also places uh, limited availability for these traveling nurses who the state uh, is looking to bring in to help with the numbers that we're seeing. What is the plan moving down the line, uh, knowing that we're seeing these high numbers, that the hospitals could get overwhelmed? And to Stephanie's point, what happens uh, if those levels can't be sustained? Yes, yeah, Stephanie is exactly right. Um, you know, I think if, if, if we had a hurricane or, or an earthquake here, then we could bring staff in from the mainland to come and help augment. Um, right now, all of the U.S. is, is having issues with, with COVID just blowing up. Um, that was really different last year when, you know, New York was a real hot spot and then Florida was a real hot spot and it sort of moved around the country, but it wasn't the entire country at once. And so you had a pool of, of um, healthcare professionals that you could tap into at any given time to kind of shift over and help us. Um, right now with COVID just raging across the U.S. in general, um, it's harder and harder to find those other healthcare workers. And so it is very much a concern. Um, we brought in... I believe it was about 45 or 46 people a week ago to the Big Island, to both Hilo and Kona. And then earlier this week, um, about 200 more people arrived 
um, to, to help the other hospitals throughout the state. And there, we're supposed to get a third wave of that. Um, but it's very concerning because, you know, it, it's almost turned into the states are, are bidding against each other to try and get these these traveling healthcare workers to to come and help. So we're we're all trying to tap into the same pool, and it is becoming challenging. Um, it's definitely a factor in the conversations that we're having. You know, healthcare workers are are tired and they're burdened and they're working under really tough con conditions. And it's not only the healthcare workers. I mean, it's the first responders also. Um, you know, everybody that has to deal with it. You know, I, I keep saying it's the public health guys. I have people here that work overnight trying to, you know, produce the data that we all count on every day. I have workers in the Department of Health that are working overnight, dealing with phone calls coming in from people with COVID, trying to help them with isolation and quarantine, trying to, you know, do case management, trying to reach out to those who are who have tested positive. I mean, we're essentially invisible. Nobody sees the guys here that are working on on everything too. So there's there's a big sector of our population that's dealing with COVID that, that's really stressed right now. You know, to to that point, there was a time where we had quarantine hotels, uh, spaces for residents to go. Um, and then earlier, you know, in a in a previous conversation, I believe in one of the news conferences, or perhaps it was with us, you said that, you know, the contact tracers cannot contact every contact of the people who have tested positive. So what what are your priorities at your department? Because you only have so many folks. Yeah, it's, it's really been about prioritization. So I think you touched on two issues. One is um, isolation and quarantine. Um, you know, with 9,600 people actively infected with COVID, there's no way that we're going to find, you know, a place for each one of those people to quarantine. It's, it just it doesn't make sense that we could do that. So what we're doing instead is we're trying really hard to prioritize. So those who are in congregate living situations and whatnot to be able to help them separate out. Um, with regards to contact tracing, again, if there are 9,600 active cases and each one was in contact with say 10 people, um, you can see that, that that's not feasible for us to contact every one of those people who may have been in contact with somebody. And so we've shifted to saying, you know, what really matters we will try and reach out to each one of those people that tested positive so that we can make contact with them and say, you know, here's what it means. Here's what you need to do. Here's what we'd like you to do. Can you please help call the people that you may have been in contact with? These are the behaviors that we need you to undertake right now. And then save the case investigators to really drill down on those cases um, that are prioritized, such as those that are healthcare um, related infections, including long-term care, um, those that are associated with schools so that we can try and prevent, you know, and really get on top if there's a cluster at a school or something. Um, and, and those that are, you know, hospitalized and, and just try and prioritize it that way. Those with, who have a high social, social vulnerability index. So we're having to prioritize in that regard. And, it, you know, a year ago or, or at some point when we had 40 cases, that was pretty easily accomplished um, with 9,600 active cases. That's a bit more challenging. You know, we see it uh, in the community. We're seeing it here in the comments, the debate that continues on between uh, those who believe in the vaccine and those who are against it. And, and there is this group of people in our community who do not believe in the vaccination and, you know, refuse to get it. And yet it seems like the message that's coming out and that we're hearing from public uh, officials and local leaders is really the only way out of this pandemic is, is to get the vaccine. But seeing that this group of people in our community uh, are against this and will likely not get the vaccine. Is there anything else that's being done to help us move on from this pandemic? Perhaps any developments that have been made on the treatment side? Uh, what is the plan if there really is this group of people that will refuse to get the vaccine and we continue to move in the way that we're going? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the goal for this is is really to, to limit an infected person spreading it to, to others, right? So however we can accomplish that. Clearly vaccine is, is the best and strongest tool that we have. It works and it's safe. Um, short of that, we have seen some, um, some progress in the treatment side. So, you know, for whoever happens to get COVID, um, we have monoclonal antibodies that work. You know, we're over a year into this now. And so we're learning more about the virus and how it operates. Um, we had monoclonal antibodies, which is, you can think of it like a medication that we could give you to sort of immediately ramp up your immune system to fight your infection. Um, 
and it, it was done through an IV and it took an hour to, to drip it in and then, you know, to kind of keep an eye on you. And there's been progress made so that it can be given sort of as a shot under your skin. Um, and so you don't need an IV and you don't need to, you know, be hooked up to an IV and all of that. Um, it still requires that you be observed for an hour and it still requires healthcare professionals to be involved in it. But it really, really expands the, the possibilities because you don't need to be in a place, you know, some places on the mainline were doing those shots in the emergency department. Some were doing it in infusion centers. This really opens up the possibility. Could you do something like this in, in a clinic, perhaps, or in a doctor's office? You know, it would depend on what sort of resources they had, but it just opens up the possibility. And then they've gone a step further now to say that for certain individuals who are at very, very high risk, is this something that you could even use um, sort of in a prophylactic way? So if I knew you got exposed, you know, if we're living in the same household and I come down with COVID and you're very fragile health wise, is this something I could give to you to try and prevent you from getting COVID from me? So it's not a panacea, it's not a big blanket thing that we can use, but, but certainly in a focused way, it is more tools for us to use, more tools in our tool chest. And, and how far away are we from having those resources available here? We do have them available. Um, we have we have a lot of um, monoclonal antibody therapies. Um, we have some of the other medications and drugs that have proven uh, useful for COVID. Um, it's it's brought in um, through the federal government, and it's available. And so you know, we've had conversations with the chief medical officers and with the federally qualified healthcare centers to let them know it's available and let them know the process for requesting it. Of course, we know that the city and county of Honolulu is now under new restrictions. Large gatherings as of today uh, are not allowed. And the mayor has uh, set that tone of, of what is allowed here with indoor and outdoor gatherings. Uh, he's saying that we're going to have to see what happens in this four week span uh, of this new restrictions. Do you believe that that will help uh, our numbers? Do you think that is enough or do you think more is needed? Um, it certainly was welcome to hear that. Um, we again we're the, the point is to try and limit person to person transmission right so that if i get infected i don't pass it on to eight other people and hopefully i don't pass it on to anybody so we know that it's spread through person to person contact it's a respiratory um disease and so if we can limit that it makes no sense to have you know gatherings of three thousand people right now even though we say you know everybody wear your mask it, it's just not a good idea and so to back off on the on the size of the gatherings that are allowed you know if people aren't employing common sense then maybe this will help them because it won't be available so keep the gathering size really small that's the best thing that we can do um really we should be doing what we did before we ever had vaccines that's how we should be thinking do you remember when we were all really really cautious and we stayed home and we went to restaurants but just to get takeout um, and we stayed in our family units um, and that's what that's what kept us safe all that time, even before we had vaccines. I mean, it sounds in a way what you're asking for us is to do a self-imposed shutdown. Brittany has this question. She says, why doesn't Hawaii shut down for two weeks? Let us get it together. Would two weeks be enough? I mean, if we get to that point where our ICUs are truly maxed and we do need a full shutdown, how long do you think we would need to be shut down to have an impact? So usually we, we like to talk in terms of two incubation periods. And so if it's 14 days, then that would be a 28 day shutdown or, you know, some, some measure that you put in place for at least um, 28 days um, before you, you can actually start seeing, you know, and quantifying some of the effects of it. I think it would, it would help almost immediately if we, if we all just stop, you know, going out and, and being in contact with other people. Um, but we know that there's a lag time for the hospitals. So even if we wiped out COVID today, um, the hospital numbers will likely continue to go up for the next you know, several days. And that's just a lag for what happened last week. And I think that's why you know, the hospitals are especially um, really stressed out about where we're sitting right now, because they know it's gonna go up for another week or so, no matter what we do at this point. One of the questions that uh, I had was looking at the vaccinations and, and really those who have gotten and initiated that first shot compared to those who are fully vaccinated. Uh, Lieutenant Governor has been on this program and a few, a few weeks back, he said 
Uh, in a few weeks, we'll be at 66% uh, because that is the total number of people that have initiated that first percent. And yet it seems that there is still a large gap between those who are fully vaccinated and those who have initiated that first dosage. Why do you think that there is uh, this lag time in us really making progress on the fully vaccinated? Uh, is, are, are people forgetting to show up for the second shot? Uh, why is it taking so long for us to get and reach some of these benchmarks uh, to reach that full vaccination? So depending on which vaccine you receive, there's a built-in lag time, right? So, so if you get your vaccine today, you're not gonna get your second shot for three weeks. Um, and if I get mine a week from now, then four weeks from now, I'll get counted in that. So we've actually done a really good job in Hawaii of, of seeing the first and second doses track carefully where people are going back to get their second dose. And I'm really grateful for that, that, that it seems like once people initiate vaccine, they're seeing it through. Um, but there's, a, there's just that built-in lag because you get your first shot and then it's three or four weeks before you get your second shot. Um, and so we will see, you know, we need, we need people to get their first shots as well as get, get their second shots in order to be constantly moving forward on that. Um, we, we have been tracking pretty well, though. When people go for their first shot, pretty much they're, they're going and following through to get their second shot. And, and what is the vaccination rate right now? Are you seeing more people as we see these numbers increase and as we hear these cases of, you know, people in the ICU saying, oh, I wish I got the vaccine. Is that having any impact? Have we seen people actually initiating that first shot at a higher rate? So thankfully, the answer is yes. Um, I think, you know, people are scared. And they should be. They really should be. Um, but we're seeing people going out and getting vaccinated uh, a little bit more than what we had been seeing. So we had been at a low of maybe a thousand shots a day in that ballpark. Um, and we're up to now we're seeing, you know, there were almost 5,000 since yesterday. So somewhere about two or 3,000 shots a day up to 5,000 a day. Um, and that's going to help us a lot. And I think if we can continue on that, you know, we had we had been as low as a six or seven thousand shots a week, and I think the past couple of weeks we've been up at about twenty thousand, and it looks like we may be trending higher than that. And I hope we are. Another question that is coming up a lot in in the comments is the availability of testing and why there aren't more uh, opportunities and options for people to get tested. Uh, we heard early on in the pandemic of progress that were being made on these rapid tests uh, and that they would soon be more available for people. And yet there seems to be a, a large need of people wanting to get testing in long lines. Uh, what can you tell us about the status on any sort of advanced testing that, that could be coming down the pipeline and more availability for testing for those who are looking for that option? Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree that we need more testing um, and we're doing our best at the state to ramp it up. Um, and some of the counties are, are pitching in as well. Um, I think one of the things to remember, though, is that this is a nationwide pandemic at, at this point with everybody flaring. It, it's reminiscent of everybody trying to get PPE when the when the pandemic first started a year and a half ago. Um, and so there's there's national competition to get some of these supplies. Um, I think the other thing for us is that, you know, if, if you think about the pandemic as it unfolded, initially it was um, testing and then the issue was contact tracing, and then the issue was isolation and quarantine, and then the issue was vaccination. And right now we're dealing with all four of those all at once. So we have a finite population that's been helping, and they were helping doing testing, and then we pulled them over, and now they're doing vaccination. And we don't want to pull them all back towards testing because we still need to do the vaccination simultaneously. And so some of it is a resource issue. Um, there have been good advances in the technology. We have more point of care testing that we can do. Um, and testing is just a tool. It really depends on how you use it and what settings and what situations. But we do have some more options. Um, thankfully, we still have a good supply of tests and we are ramping up you know, as we speak to get more testing out there. The other thing is, you know, we used to pay for testing and nobody wants to pay for it anymore. And so we're trying to do our best to make it free and available for everybody statewide, make it accessible for people so they can get tested. 
I want to bring in, I know we're almost out of time, but Angela Keene has a question here that I think it's a good one. She says, Department of Health numbers show 1,800 Keiki diagnosed with COVID since July. What are the long-term concerns for these Keiki, especially COVID long haul? I know that, um, you know, by and large, kids tend to do better than adults, but there's still so many concerns. And if you have a child under 12 that is in school right now and they happen to be exposed or happen to get COVID, uh, you know, what are you telling parents about the long-term risks of this disease? So what we're seeing now is that about 20 to 25 percent of the case counts that we have every day are in pediatric population. Um, and we are seeing younger people get sick. Um, we don't know about the long term effects, right? This is the first time we've seen this. It's unfolding as we live and breathe. So we're, we're watching it. Um, there is something that's been pretty well documented, the MISC, the multi um, the multi system inflammation and we don't know the long-term effects. Um, certainly children don't get as sick as adults for the most part, but we don't want any kids to get sick. We don't want any kids to, to have to deal with long haul COVID. Um, we just don't know at this point, we're watching it unfold. Um, I think the real message is, you know, why are the real young kids getting it? Especially that they're not old enough to get vaccinated. And so we as adults need to be responsible and we need to if you're 12 and older, you should get vaccinated. If you have contact with anybody who's younger than 12, you should get vaccinated so that we can protect those little ones that can't get vaccinated yet. As we wind down here this morning, wanted to just give you an opportunity, any final words and a message for those viewers and, and those who may be tuning in later through this rebroadcast, uh, your message uh, during this time. Yeah, thank you. I, I think, you know, the message is that we, we are, living through this as a community and and wherever you fall within that community we are still one community um we need to band together we need to all help each other out to get through this um we have no choice we will get through it one way or another but i would like to see us get through it with the least amount of of you know injury or illness to our loved ones um vaccines work they're safe they're effective um and in the meantime what we can all do is keep our distance from each other um, we know what works. We know that wearing our masks works really, really well. And we know that, that keeping to our family groups and staying away from big parties or mixing or gathering with others will keep us safe. So we know what to do. It's just a matter of us needing to do it. Okay, Dr. Libby Char joining us from the Department of Health this morning. We really appreciate your time this morning and all that you are doing for the state. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Aloha, thanks. Well, you heard it there from the director and she's, you know, giving us the message that she's been consistently giving us, which is to get vaccinated, to be careful and uh, and really to behave. Now, she says, as if the vaccine did not exist. Remember when that was, she said, do the things that you did then to help to pre prevent the spread. Now, one interesting thing, though, that she did say is that while we, she is seeing uh, 20 to 25 percent of the cases every day, they are pediatric. They, by and large, are not clustered in the schools. They are kids catching it at home and then being identified in the schools. And so I know a lot of parents are watching right now and a lot of people are writing in saying, give us more distance learning, give us, uh, you know, give us the option to get out of school. Um, but she is reassuring the public that right now from her purview, school is safe. Yeah. And interesting to note, uh, you know, when she talks about the amount of people that are working uh, through this pandemic, of course, uh, talking about the pressures that it has on our healthcare system and the healthcare workers who are continuing to uh, really battle and, and save people's lives, but also those who are working within the department and, and saying that they have gone through a lot. I mean, you know, when you she kind of pull, pulled the curtain back and said, look uh, at where we started. Uh, we started with it starting off with testings, isolation, uh, then it became the vaccine. And now they're having to deal with all of that at the same time, uh, given the numbers, given the demand for testing and vaccinations. And so uh, there's a lot of hands that are working hard at the Department of Health, as well as supporting agencies right now. And their message continues to be to push the vaccination. She's saying that we are seeing an uptick uh, in the state with those who are uh, now getting the vaccine, maybe because of these high numbers, uh, but continuing to push that message out to those out there who may still be on the fence about whether or not to get the vaccine. Yeah, she also reiterated that hospitals are very stressed right now and that if we were to get to a point where the hospitals were so taxed that they could not take any more patients and thus needed a shutdown, 
she said that they would likely have to shut the state down for two cycles. So that's 28 days at a minimum. Um, so that is something to consider. We all need to do our part to stop the spread so that that does not happen. Um, because the idea of shutting down the state for 28 days, while some in the comments are calling for it, we know that, you know, economically that would be devastating for so many. And we've heard from the mayor that uh, he does not want to do that, that he is trying to find ways to uh, do that, you know, create re uh, rules and restrictions that will not uh, shut any businesses down. And we're going to have the opportunity to talk to the mayor more in depth about this latest restriction on group gathering sizes, as well as uh, the many other issues that the city is facing right now when he joins us on Friday. Yeah, it's been a while since we've had a chance to speak in depth with Mayor Blangiardi, so we are very much looking forward to that. We hope all of you join us then. That is 1030 on Friday. Until then, uh, please stay safe. Remember what the Department of Health Director shared with us this morning. If you have the opportunity, please share this video. If you know someone who's not vaccinated, perhaps encourage them to watch it as well. We'll see you on Friday. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii was brought to you by Chaminade University.